Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Software Development with C++. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about watch points in GDB. So in the previous video, we looked at the basics of debugging with GDB. And specifically, we were mainly using breakpoints for this. So as a reminder, breakpoints allowed us to tell our debugger that we want to stop execution when we hit particular points inside of our code and inside of our control flow. Now, while this can be good for debugging some of our uh, you know, types of bugs that we encounter, it's not ne necessarily the best in all circumstances. There are other circumstances where we have incredibly complex control flow, um, and it can be very difficult to know exactly where in a program we want to stop or put a breakpoint. Now, in situations like this, what we'd ideally want is the ability to monitor some expression and see whenever that changes. Um, so for example, we might want to monitor whenever certain pieces of data change inside of our program. And instead of hunting down all the places where they might happen, we might want to have that done more automatically. Now, this is exactly what we get with watch points. So we go ahead and take a look at the right-hand side of the screen. Um, I have the, uh, some of the documentation for GDB up on setting watch points. And it says that you can use a watch point to stop execution wherever the value of an expression changes without having to predict a particular place where this may happen. And that this is sometimes called a data breakpoint. So what watch points really allow us to do is debug more based on our data rather than our control flow. So we're going to be looking at a couple examples today. Right? Our first example doesn't actually have any bugs, but we're still going to use watch points to see how we can watch values change inside of a program. And then our second example is what I think is a very fun type of bug to debug where watch points uh, really shine. So let's go ahead and get started here. And we'll start by opening up this uh, zero error.cpp, right? Our first program. So here it's a pretty simple piece of code. All we're going to do is dynamically allocate some memory here um, for this pointer P. Then what we're going to do is set the value of all the contents in this array that we allocated here equal to 10. Then we're going to set the contents equal to 20. And then we're going to free our memory. So no real bugs inside of this program, but we're going to see how the contents of this array changes over time. So let's go ahead and quit out of here. And we can compile zero error.cpp with dash G. And we can go ahead and run this executable uh, with GDB. So, okay, we have GDB started up. The first thing we can do is just go to the start of our program here, right? The very beginning of our main function. So you can see when we run start, it just takes us to the beginning of main here. And we can do list to get some more context. So we're right here where we're about to assign n equal to 1024 here, the size of our array. Okay. So let's go ahead and set a watch point. Um, so some expression that we want to watch throughout the execution of our program here. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll set watch and then maybe some, uh, you know, some index inside of our array P here. So maybe we want to uh, watch P24 here as our expression, right? So now we've set a hardware watch point with this expression P24. So we're monitoring what happened when this value is going to change, right? When we evaluate the expression P indexing into the 24th element, that's when we're gonna trigger our hardware watch point. Now, just like breakpoints, we can get information about our watch points and which watch points we've already set. So if we do info watch points, you can see that we have this one watch point here, um, right at P24, right? That's our expression. Okay, so from there, let's go ahead and just continue our program and see where our watch point stops first. And you can see that, um, you know, we hit our watch point and we went from old value unreadable to new value zero here. And if we go ahead and do list to get some more context here, right, you can see that we stopped on line 10 of our program. So that's the beginning of this for loop here. So we just uh, executed this allocation here. So we said, you know, P is equal to new int in here. So we went from having unreadable memory to now, right, whenever we did this new, we suddenly have some memory uh, backing this pointer P here, right? So and we happen to go from unreadable before the allocation to zero after the allocation. Okay, so that's our first watch point that we hit. Let's go ahead and continue on and see where we next hit a stop point in our program. So we'll go ahead, go ahead and do continue here. And you can see that we hit our watch point again, right, with this expression P24. And it again happens to be at line 10 of our program inside of this for loop. So we'll go ahead and do list again. 
and we can see that this is our for loop that is setting the contents of our array equal to 10. And our old value was 0, and our new value was 10. So if we go ahead and do something like print our current index here, we see that our current index is 24. So this should make sense why we hit our watch point here. We just did p of i is equal to 24 is equal to 10 here, right? So we had an assignment, um, right, that changed the value of this expression or that this expression returned. Okay, so we can go ahead and do continue one final time. And what we end up hitting is our next for loop here, right? And our old value is 10 and our new value is 20. So this is our loop where we're just setting the contents of this array equal to 20 now. And unsurprisingly, if we do print of i, you can see that we're at i is equal to 24 again, right? We're just setting the contents of this array p equal to 20. And our hardware watch point stopped us whenever we modified, say, uh, index 24 into this array. Now, finally, we can just run continue again. You can see we just run to the end of our program. We didn't end up hitting this watch point ever again. Okay. So that's going to go ahead and you know, do it for this simple example. It's kind of the basics of how we set these watch points. Let's see how we can uh, apply it to a more interesting kind of bug here. So for that, let's go ahead and open up this one error.cpp. Now we're mainly just going to be focusing on uh, our main function as we run through this code here. In many cases, when we're doing debugging, um, you know, we're not looking at every single piece of code in our program. We're just looking more at, at the high level of logically what we should be doing. And then we you know, dive deeper into our code as we need to. So at this point, right, we just know that we've written some code right inside of this main function here. And we're using a couple functions that we have defined elsewhere. So here, right, what we're doing is we're creating two arrays here of 1024 integers, p random and p ones here. Um, both of these have 1024 elements. Then we're using some helper function called ones to set the contents of our ones array equal to all ones. And then we're using some helper function called random here to set the contents of our array p random equal to, you know, all kind of random numbers here, random integers. And then at the very end of our program, we have a simple functionality check here, where all we're going to do is iterate over our ones array here and make sure that all the values are equal to one here. So if a value is not equal to one, we'll say we have an incorrect value at index, We'll print out the index and we'll print out the value here. So we're just making sure that ones did the right thing, right? So let's go ahead and quit out of here and start our debugging. So first, let's just make sure that our program is correct, right? Or see if it's correct. So we'll go ahead and compile this one error.cpp, right? With dash G and we'll go ahead and run one error. And what we see is that we got incorrect values at index zero, right? So the first element in her ones array seems to be giving us an incorrect value here. So we failed our assertion. So if we go ahead and run this again, right? And you see, we get a different value here, but we keep failing at, you know, index zero of our P ones array here. So let's go ahead and try to debug this with GDB. So we'll go ahead and do GDB and we'll run one error and we'll go ahead and go to start here. Now let's go ahead and you know, do what we were kind of doing last time and debugging using breakpoints here. So we know that ones is the only function and only part of this program where we're explicitly modifying this ones array here. So maybe let's set a breakpoint right at line 31 here, right? So just after we execute ones and see you know, how things look at that point here. So you know, we'll go ahead and set a breakpoint at line 31 here, and we'll go ahead and continue our program, right? Okay, so we hit our next breakpoint. So here we're at line 31 of our program. We just executed ones here. You can see if we go ahead and print out uh, P ones here, that's going to be our pointer to our integers. We can use X to examine memory at a particular location here. So we can just copy and paste this value, right? To get index zero of this array and what's at index zero. And we can see that after we call ones here, we have the value zero or value one at that spot. So it looks like our ones function did the right thing, right? And that's the only place where we're actually explicitly uh, uh, passing this ones array here. So this can leave us a little bit baffled at first, right? So this is why breakpoints are not always the best tool for the job here. 
um, you know, logically we kind of went through our code and we knew that, okay, we're only passing P1s to our ones function here. So let's check the value after that call to that function, but the value is correct, right? So that didn't actually tell us anything uh, useful. All it told us uh, is that, well, ones isn't responsible for it. The only piece of code that should be modifying ones, right? Or that we even pass ones to, right? So, you know, maybe give us some useful information in terms of we know that ones isn't the problem, but it doesn't really tell us where to look next, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and delete these breakpoints we have with D, and let's go ahead and restart our program, right? Uh, so we'll just go back to the start. And let's see how we can debug this instead using watch points, right? We know the part of memory that we want to inspect. We know that it's being changed someplace to a value that we do not expect. So let's go ahead and just monitor, um, you know, that location, right? Using a watch point. So here, right, we're back to the start of our program, right? Back to the top of main here. And let's go ahead and set a watch point uh, P1s of zero here. We know that that zero index is bad. So we'll watch P1s zero. Then we can go ahead and run continue here. And we go ahead and see, we go from some old value of, you know, kind of whatever to a new value of zero here, right before our call to ones. So if we go ahead and do list. You can see that's right after we do our dynamic allocation, right? So we hit our watch point because we did our allocation, um, the value or result of that expression, P0 or P1's zero changed. Uh, so that's why we hit our first watch point. So from there, we can go ahead and run continue again. And what we end up seeing is that we get our watch point hit inside of our ones function here. This should be somewhat intuitive. Inside of our ones function, we're setting the contents of this array equal to all ones here. So unsurprisingly, we go from an old value zero to a new value of one here, right? So you can see it gives us some information about the call to this function ones, see the array that we're passing in here, so the address of P ones, and also n is equal to 1024 here. And you can see, right, we just set the contents of this array equal to one. Okay, so from there, right, that's the last time we would expect to modify uh, P ones at index zero. So let's go ahead and continue and see where, you know, that memory or that expression results in a different value. So we'll go ahead and run continue again. And you can see that we get something somewhat surprising here. We're actually accessing our P1s array from inside of a random function. And you can see that from the call right here, we're not even passing our P1s array into our function here, right? You can see that we have this, you know, address that we're passing in for our array into random, and it says hex 555-5555-6BEB0. If we scroll back up to our call to ones here, you can see we passed a completely different array into this function here. We passed this, you know, bunch of fives followed by 6CEC0 here, right? So already things are looking somewhat suspicious here, right? We're not even passing in the right array, but somehow we're modifying uh, or rather we're passing in a different array, but somehow we're modifying our P1s array, right, from random. So from here, let's go ahead and do list and see what we're actually doing inside of this function here. So we're at line 21, we're at the end of our function. So the previous statement that we just executed was this weird array of 1028 is equal to some random number here. So this index into our, you know, P random array is somehow modifying our P ones array. Now to really understand this, what we can do is just print out the address, right? We can just print out array plus 1028 here, right? That's essentially what we're doing at this indexing, right? We're accessing the base of this array plus 1028. And what we see is we get the exact same memory location as the start of P ones here. So what we have is this really kind of fun memory stomp error, right? We index off of the end of our P random array, and instead of just hitting some invalid memory, we wound up on another array that belongs to this program, right? So this is a very interesting and frustrating kind of issue that we can run into um, where we index off, you know, out of bounds um, for some array 
and what we wind up uh, doing instead of hitting some invalid memory. We hit somewhere else in, in the memory that belongs to this program. And if we're doing a write, that can be especially bad because suddenly some random pro value inside of our program uh, can suddenly change right in an unexpected place like it is here. Despite the fact we're passing in two different arrays to these functions, we're indexing off the end of one array and we happen to be hitting um, one of our other arrays here, right? Okay, so now we've kind of debugged what's going on here, right? We're indexing out of bounds inside of this random function, and we happen to be hitting on another one of our arrays. And watch points made it really easy to debug this, because instead of just completely focusing in on our control flow and where we should be modifying things, we were able to modify expressions uh, of data, right? And see where our data was actually being modified inside of our program a bit more dynamically. Okay, so that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. It's an introduction to using watch points for debugging. They're an incredibly useful tool, just like breakpoints, right? So both breakpoints and watch points both have their place in debugging, right? It's all about using the right tool for the job. Now, as always, you can find this or any of my other examples at github.com slash coffee before arch. But as always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.